up, Lou. Ken and I are laying for you. Oh, what did I forget to do? <laughs> Relax, Lou. This is no court martial. Tech and I just wanted to let you in on some 1959 model features. In fact, Tech's standing on one of the latest V8 engines. Ah, so that's one of the new power plants. What's it got mostly? More muscle? Yep. More power, improved performance, higher efficiency. You name it, it's got it, Lou. And on more of the 59 engines, you'll be able to reach the distributor, oil pump, and oil filter without snapping a suspender. That's good news for sure, Ken. How do the engine changes stack up by models? Well, on Plymouth, there are two 318 cubic inch V8 engines. One is a two-barrel carburetor job, the other a four-barrel. Each one has a different camshaft. There's also a 361 cubic inch Plymouth engine with a four-barrel carburetor. It replaces the 350 cubic inch engine used in some models last year. All Plymouth engines will have longer life, too. The use of heavy-duty copper lead connecting rod bearings is one reason. Yeah, Lou, and besides that, Timing chain lubrication system on both these 318 cubic inch engines is new. A chamfer on the front end of the crankshaft, front main bearing, directs oil more effectively to the chain and to the front end of the crankshaft. Both engines also use new synthetic rubber oil pan seals with tabs. The tabs are pulled through holes in the pan for better anchoring. Makes them especially snug. I see. Any other features on these engines? Yep. The high-performance type camshaft used only with the Super Pack last year will now be standard on the two-barrel carburetor job. The cams hold intake and exhaust valves open four degrees longer, providing better performance. There's also a simpler timing procedure for these engines, Lou. A plate on the timing chain cover carries the timing marks. You check a dot on the pulley against these marks. After top dead center, marks are no longer shown. Not bad, Ken. Not bad. We'll have better carburation, too, Lou. There's a new three-stage step-up piston system that gives finer fuel control. The new piston tailors the fuel mixture more closely to the engine requirements. Now, in this new setup, there's a new spring piston and newly designed step-up piston cylinder. In addition, there's a new two-diameter step-up rod. This new system provides an intermediate range for cruising speed. As a result, there's better economy and improved performance over a wider range of engine operation. Here's something else. There's a new crossover passage in the manifold that provides better performance during warm-up. Hey, that sounds good. Anything else on fuel? Yep. In the tank, a 40-micron fuel filter replaces the 80-micron unit. Gasoline coming to the pump and carburetor will therefore be cleaner. In addition... A new 5-micron paper element fuel filter is available as an optional feature on all models except Plymouth. Now, here's another engine item. On the 318 cubic inch 4-barrel job, a new camshaft holds intake and exhaust valves open 4 degrees longer than the Super Pack camshaft used last year. Then, with larger pipes on a new dual exhaust to decrease back pressure, you naturally increase power in the higher engine RPM range. There's also a slight increase in engine torque. Very clear. Now, anything new on the four-barrel carburetor? Larger floats, Lou. Being bigger, they keep fuel level in the bowl under more uniform control. The fuel flow is better regulated and operations a lot smoother. Along with that, there's a better design crossover type automatic choke. It improves economy during warm-up. And on top of the carburetor is a brand new air cleaner. Lower in height, it's especially designed and tuned to the engine for efficient and quiet operation. Now, those are highlights on the 318 cubic inch engines. Let's give the new super duper 361 cubic inch job a once over. I'm talking about the new Golden Commando engine. It's even larger, of course. Torque is increased. Compression ratio is 10 to 1. There's a new low restriction air cleaner. A high-output camshaft holds both valves open 260 degrees. Now, this engine also has a special radiator, battery, starter, distributor, and uses larger pipes in its dual exhaust system. Yeah, and this engine uses the new A32-type spark plug without the resistor. The resistance is now built into the spark plug cables. Well, that's something new, all right. Yeah, it's a non-metallic cable. 
The core is impregnated with some kind of electrical conducting material for radio noise suppression. Uh, be careful when removing these cables. If you yank them off the plugs or from the distributor cap, you might stretch the cables or pull them loose from the terminals. That would increase the resistance in the cable. So disconnect the cable by grasping the terminal boot, not the cable. Okay, Ken. I'll watch out for that. Good. Now, all the new V8 engines, remember, will now take five quarts of oil rather than four. And when you change the oil filter, you'll have to add an extra quart. Does that apply to the sixes, too? Yep. The new sixes, incidentally, use new alloy exhaust valves that are tulip-shaped. The alloy makes them stronger at high temperature and more resistant to corrosion. Performance and engine life both benefit. How come the tulip shape? That shape helps the valve conform to changes that take place in the valve seat at extreme operating heat. So both the valves and seats last longer due to better seating. Something else that's going to last longer is the 59 muffler. On sixes, muffler heads are zinc coated and shells are wrapped in asbestos. By retaining heat, asbestos cuts down moisture formation in the muffler. On V8s, muffler heads and shells are zinc coated in addition to the asbestos wrapping. So muffler life is practically doubled. Well, so much for the new Plymouth engines. Now let's talk about other engines. Take the Dodge Coronet model, for example, with its new 325 cubic inch V8 engine. It has a Stromberg WW3 carburetor and hydraulic tappets. Now, some of these engines may have adjustable rocker arms, too. But don't change the adjustment. Right. Remember, this engine always has hydraulic tappets, so don't monkey with the adjustable rocker arms. On Dodge Royal and Sierra models, a 361 cubic inch engine with a two-barrel BBD carburetor is standard. The same engine with a four-barrel carburetor is standard on custom Royal and custom Sierra models. Dodge also has the 230 cubic inch six-cylinder engine in Coronet, two- and four-door models, and in the two-door hardtops. Okay, Ken. That about it on Dodge? Right. Now, the DeSoto Fire Sweep will use the same 361 cubic inch engine as the Dodge Royal and Sierra models with the two-barrel carburetor. A four-barrel carburetor is available as optional equipment. Now, the next engine to talk about, Lou, is a 383-cubic-inch V8 made in two models. Uh, what's the difference between those two models, Ken? Well, they use different bore and stroke combinations. Both have wedge-type combustion chambers and a 10-to-1 compression ratio. Both require premium fuel. Now, one of these engines has a bore of four and one quarter inches and a stroke of three and three eighths inches. It's used in the DeSoto Fire Dome, Fire Flight, and Adventurer models, and in the Dodge D500. The other engine has a bore of four and one thirty seconds and a stroke of three and three quarter inches. This engine is used in the Chrysler, Windsor, and Saratoga models. There's still another engine, Lou, but somebody better turn this record over before Ken tells you about it. That engine Tech just mentioned is a brand new V8 for the Chrysler New Yorker, the C300E, and the Imperial. It has a displacement of 413 cubic inches, a compression ratio of 10 to 1, and uses premium fuel. And like all the new 59 V8s, it has a wedge-type combustion chamber and hydraulic tappets. boy, Ken. Besides the new engines, many improvements have been made in automatic transmissions. One of these is the water cooling of the fluid. Oh, yeah. That was done on some models last year. That's right. Now all V8 jobs with automatic transmissions have it. Fluid is piped to and from a cooler in the radiator's lower tank. This cooling dissipates heat, so the transmission operates better and lasts longer. Say, how about that new torque converter housing installation on the Plymouth V8 engine? Yeah, that's right, Tech. The torque converter housing adapter plate has been eliminated. A new housing with an integral front face is used. This provides a more rigid mounting. And as a result, vibrations reduced, and the starter motor and ring gear are kept in better alignment. Starting motor operation, therefore, is smoother and quieter. Smoother and quieter seems to be the mark of a 59 car. That it is, Lou, and better by far. Take the front suspension changes as a good example. You mean torsion air has been changed? Whatever for? 
As good as it's been, Lou, progress can't sit still. But you like the new refinements because they make your service job a whale of a lot easier. Tech's right, Lou. There's a new cam action adjustment for setting caster and camber right on the nose. You no longer need to use shims. But to understand this adjustment fully, let's look over the construction details. Upper control arms are new. Each arm uses larger bushings and four new support brackets welded to the frame. Each bracket has a cam retainer welded to its outer face. Horizontal slots are provided for the adjusting bolt movement. Integral cams are welded under the head of each bolt. Matching, removable cams are located on a flat at the threaded end. I can begin to see how those cams operate, Ken. It's a pretty neat idea. Sure. By turning both front and rear adjusting bolts and cams in the same direction, the bolts move horizontally in the brackets. This moves the upper control arm in or out, increasing or decreasing camber with little or no change in caster. Now, by turning the bolts an equal amount in opposite directions, you move the ball joint end of the arm forward or rearward to increase or decrease caster with little or no change in camber. Once you get the desired settings, tighten the bolt nuts to 65 foot-pounds torque. Now, since tightening may move the bolt, be sure to hold the bolt head while snugging down the nut. You should always recheck camber and caster. I get it, Ken. And once I catch on to it, it is going to be easier. Notice the new ball joints, Lou. They have grooves to retain lubricant better for longer, quieter operation. And their rubber seals keep dirt and water out more effectively. Yeah, and torsion bars are shorter on all models. A new rubber collar on the bar keeps dirt and moisture from getting into the anchor. Very interesting. Anything new on rear suspension? Anything new? <laughs> Man, didn't you hear about our optional car leveling device? Yeah, Lou, we've got a new air spring system available for the rear axle on 59 models. Here's what it looks like. There's a belt-driven air compressor mounted on the engine and a high-pressure tank mounted at the front end of the frame. At the rear axle end, there's a low-pressure tank, the height control valve and linkage, air springs, and a high-pressure air line. Constant height is maintained by a bleed-feed type height control valve. And since our leveling system is an auxiliary to our leaf springs, there's no serious problem if the air springs get damaged or the valves get out of adjustment. Uh, what kind of service might this system need? Well, if the car doesn't maintain its proper height, it might be due to an incorrect adjustment of the height control valve. Right, or if correct height can't be maintained with the compressor running, Check the control valve adjustment. Also, test for leaks in the control valve, air spring, low pressure tank. Other possibilities to check are all explained in this reference book, Lou. Good deal, Ken. Now, what else are we going to cover in the way of 59 features? The brand new heating and air conditioning system, Lou. It's mounted in the same location, but the entire system is new in design. It's operated by push buttons on the instrument panel. The blower, motor, and housing are on the passenger side of the dash panel. A damper in the distribution duct directs air through outlet grills in the instrument panel or through an outlet just above floor level. An adjustable deflector in the lower outlet also lets you aim air toward the floor or up at the passengers. This is an automatic or a manual adjustment. You have a choice. There's a rear air conditioning unit that mounts in the luggage compartment. Right. You can have the rear unit instead of the front one or with it to increase air conditioning output. In addition to that, there's a roof-mounted air conditioning unit available for Suburbans. You use this to supplement output of the front unit. The roof and front units work together automatically. Can you get one without the other? Uh, no point in that, Lou. You need both units in Suburbans. There's so much more glass and roof area and so much more cubic feet of space that two units do a better air conditioning job. Now, the units in general work about the same as before. In detail, though, the buttons give you the degree of air conditioning you desire. A sliding lever provides control of the water flow valve to regulate temperature. The switch controlling the blower motor is in the end of the sliding lever. 
Center switch position is off. You get low blower speed with the switch knob pushed in, high speed with the knob pulled out. Doors are controlled by vacuum actuators. These are diaphragm units that get vacuum from the intake manifold or from a vacuum tank. A rod is attached to the diaphragm and the other end is connected to a door or damper. That's right. Vacuum lines go to the vacuum actuators. The push button actuates a valve to admit vacuum to one side of the diaphragm. As the diaphragm moves, it moves the door or damper. Push buttons also control electrical circuits to the air conditioning, magnetic clutch, and blower motor. Now, so much for that. Let's look at another useful feature optional for 59. It's an electronic device that dims your headlights automatically. Mm-hmm. Interesting gadget. Where does it go on the car? On the instrument panel, Lou, in line with the steering column center line. It dims your lights when you're about a thousand feet from an oncoming car and flicks them on bright again a half second after you pass. Right, and this device is sensitive to taillights, too. When you come too close behind the car, it dims your lights so you won't blind the driver in the car ahead of you. And even though the electronic device is automatic, you can still override its action by using the conventional foot dimmer switch. Sounds right handy, Ken. Now, what else we got in store? Well, all of our cars will display new roof panel treatment, new hood, front fender, grill, and bumpers. It's going to be a 59 forward look version that's bound to be appealing. Boy, that's certainly a bushel of changes you've covered on 59 models. There are more new style features, Lou, but we wanted you in the know on mechanical changes first. And now that you have a better idea about the new line, this reference book will give you extra service information you'll find very handy. So look it over right away and be ready for quicker, better service on the 59 cars.